nothing between my soul and my Savior. All that He asks, that will I do. Ever my will, my life on the altar, to know you, my Lord, with nothing between. Let us respond with this call to worship this morning. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. You in the right spirit within us. My name is Josh Kiesling, and I get to serve with the care and connections ministries of our church. And I want to get to know you and you to get to know me. And so if we haven't met, please uh, come and let's introduce ourselves sometime. Because I actually want to connect to you, hence my title. Um, but... There is some way that you can also connect to the church and breathe life into our church as well. You have an awesome opportunity. We do as a church on February 25th, right after the second service, we are hosting a forum where you can come and share your thoughts and ideas and hear what's going on in the life of our church as it regards to our mission and vision. And we want you to be a part of that. So if you would, because there is lunch involved, so there's an incentive, but also let Pastor Emily know by Thursday if you are planning to attend so we can make sure that there is enough food. Because we want to hear from you. We want your thoughts and ideas. Well, as we continue in worship, would you pray with me this prayer? With God, we come with hesitant steps and uncertain motives to sweep out the corners where sin has accumulated and uncover the ways that we have strayed from your truth. Expose the empty and the barren places where we do not allow you to enter. Reveal our heart, our half-hearted struggles where we have been indifferent to the suffering of others. Nurture that faint strings of new life where your spirit has begun to grow. Let your healing light transform us into the image of your son, for you alone can bring new life and make us whole. Amen. Church, each week we respond to God's invitation to worship. We gather in this sanctuary or perhaps online from all over Grant County and around the world, from the places that we live and work. We all carry with us our little stories. And on Sunday, we gather to submit our lives to God's greater story, to be restoried by his narrative, his desires, his hopes. 
So with that in mind, would you stand and let's unite our voices together in giving him praise. Holy, holy, holy. Let's take it a step further. If you're willing to just share very briefly the time you were lost with the person next to you. 30 seconds, go. Like I said, I, I have been lost, like my parents have forgotten me, I've gotten lost driving, walking, hiking, all of that. But the story that comes to mind the most when I think about getting lost, I was visiting a friend in, who lived in another state while I was in college. And I was driving uh, down these county roads that, and it was like pitch black, so dark, not a single street light or it seemed like the stars, the moon was gone. And my phone had died and uh, my directions were bad or, I was bad at following my directions and the feeling of being lost with no sign or marker brought on such like a despair in my heart. I, I started to feel like, oh my goodness, like I'm going to be out here for forever. Um, being lost is scary. Feeling lost is scary. And throughout scripture, we see that God's people are often lost. They are often wandering. And this doesn't have as much to do with their geographic location as it does the posture of their hearts. Um, and in their lostness, there's a despair or a fear or a desire for control that we see settle in. And so this manifests usually in two ways. Israel sort of come, takes on this self-reliance. We want a king. We want to provide for ourselves. Or they take on the practices and habits of the nations around them. And a lot, a lot of times these practices are evil. And they start worshiping the gods of these other nations in order to gain a sense of safety or control. And whenever God's people are far from him, the message that we hear almost always first from the prophets or another voice is remember. Remember the Lord your God 
Remember the God of your ancestors. Remember the God who brought you out of Egypt. Remember the one who fed you in the desert. Remember the God who gave you water from a rock. Remember, remember, because remembering serves as one of the first signs or markers that help people who are lost find their way back to the path of life. And so today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. This is an ancient historic practice of about 40 days that gives the people of God space and time to remember and to reflect, specifically to examine our lives in light of God's goodness and his holiness and love. And it calls us to repent, which that word means to literally change directions. Repent of the things that hinder or entangle us and to put on new practices that would draw us or form us more into the image of God. And so this morning, as we continue singing, we are invited to remember, to remember the Lord your God who has called you by name and to remember who you are in him. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Sing Jesus Jesus the name above every other Sing name Jesus. defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us clean hands. Ash. 
compassion and unfailing love which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O oh God. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenants and obey his commands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give us clean. Let us pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we bring before you those needs, those concerns in our community, those who have lost loved ones, those who are undergoing surgeries and on the other side of recovery. 
And Lord, those that are just burdens on our hearts, we lift them up to you this morning. And Lord, we think of our ministry partners in Grant County and to the ends of the earth. We ask that you would step into those lives in mighty ways. Continue to be who you are. And Lord, as we pray and focus on this Lenten journey, we may not even really be ready in our minds. We might think that it's easier to stay in our safety, in our little closed-in comfort zones. But Lord, help us to take the risks, to look outward and to look inward, to look beyond ourselves to the joy that awaits us. Give us hearts of courage and strength for the tasks which lie ahead. Be with each one of us and move us from this winter of discouragement to the spring of hope, the cleanses of our spirits to make us truly ready to be your disciples. For we ask this, Lord Jesus, in your holy name, amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from the gospel according to Matthew. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with her father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back in Genesis chapter 32, Jacob is on the run from his brother. His brother wants to kill him. They come to a river called the Jabbok River. Jacob, at that point, has a couple of wives. He has 11 sons. When they get to the Jabbok, he tells his sons to go on the other side with his wives. He will spend the night on this side. No sooner has the family gone across the fords of the river when Jacob has hunkered down when a man comes out of nowhere and jumps him. They engage in a fight. They wrestle. The word there literally means to get down and dirty. So this is not an argument. This is something like a fist fight. It's a wrestling match. They go down to the ground and then they go back up again. And this goes on, we guess, for an hour or two. You imagine how exhausting it would be to wrestle somebody for a couple of hours who is better than you. After a couple of hours, this messenger, angel, or God himself realizes that while Jacob will never win the fight, he won't lose it either. And so he touches Jacob's hip. And when he does, he throws it out of socket. Jacob falls to the ground. When he fell, he must have grabbed the man and pulled him on top of himself. Because after wrestling a little bit longer, the man says to Jacob, let me go. Jacob says, not until you bless me. The man says, what is your name? He says, Jacob, which means deceiver. The man says, not anymore. Tonight, your name is changed. It's no longer Jacob. You're no longer a deceiver. Your name is Israel, which means he wrestles with God. 
He fights with God. For the man says, you have wrestled with God and overcome. Jacob says, what's your name? The man says, why do you ask my name? And vanishes. Jacob now still on the ground, rolling around, trying to soothe that hip. Trying to gather himself, notices that the sun is slowly beginning to rise. They've been at it all night. And as it rises, Jacob realizes what has happened. And he renames the place where they fought. He calls it Peniel, which means face of God. For he says, it is here that I have wrestled with God. I have seen the face of God. And I lived. I begin with the story because it, it's so typical of many conversion experiences. Some of us in the room, not all of us, maybe not even most of us, but some of us in the room have had our own night at the Jabbok, where out of nowhere it seems God came upon us in the form of a fight. We didn't expect it. You never see it coming. Sometimes it's unfair. It's always undeserved. But suddenly you find yourself in the middle of a fight, not only with others, but with God. But if we can stay in that fight without leaving him, something happens. He changes us. We are converted. We are no longer deceiver. We are now one who wrestles with God. We are one who has seen the face of God. That seems to be the pattern of every conversion. It's always unexpected. It often arises from a struggle. After the struggle, there is a moment of release. We are touched, and after that, our identity is changed. Nothing in our life is the same from that moment on. Now, I say this because I think, as I said, there are some in the room that have had your night with God. I have more than one. And that's where I want to go. I, I think... In the church, we have conflated conversion with getting saved. And I don't think it's the same thing. When Christians talk about crusades, they always want to know how many got converted. But, but, but conversion doesn't mean surrender. It means to change. It means to pivot, to go in another direction. So whenever you're asking who was converted, you're not asking who repeated a prayer, who was baptized, or who took the sacrament for the first time, who made a public profession. That's not conversion. That's a profession. A conversion is the actual substantive change that comes about after that. And, and that's, that's pretty important because there are some who had that night with God they have repeated a prayer, they have come to an altar, they have taken communion, and they have considered themselves converted as a result of that. But since that was their conversion, it's like nothing more is needed. Only it is. Others of us, this includes me right now, I think it's some of you who grew up in the church. We, I can never... Remember a day when I wasn't saved. There were moments that seemed important to me, but I can't tell you everything changed in that night because, I mean, I grew up in a religious home. So I don't know how to speak of becoming a Christian because 
when you grow up religious, it feels like you always were. Are you there? So I think what is needed is a way to speak about being converted without making us seem like we're lost. So I am this year seeking another conversion. And I want one for you, even if you've never had one. I want there to be a defining moment in your life where out of nowhere, God just jumps you. And you get into this struggle with God. And even though you can't win it, you say, I will not lose. And in the middle of that struggle, God touches you and he changes something in you. And as a result of that, you walk different for the rest of your life. Your identity has been changed. I think there's precedence for this in the Gospels. If I go into the story of the disciples, the, the, the ones who decided to follow Jesus, um, there's this moment in Luke chapter 22. It's right it's, it's actually Jesus' last night as a free person. The next day he will be betrayed and then they will take him and crucify him. This is, he's been with them now for three years. He's got the disciples with him around the table, which we call the Last Supper. At the table in Luke 22, he says to his disciples, you are my disciples and I confer unto you a kingdom like the one my father conferred unto me. So you will eat at my table and you will rise up to judge the tribes of Israel. This is as good as it gets. Then a moment later, he turns to Peter at the table and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Now listen. And after you're converted, strengthen the brothers. So you don't miss it. This is not said at the beginning of Peter's spiritual life. It said three years into his spiritual life. If you were to ask me when Peter was converted in the evangelical sense, I would have said, oh, on the day he was called. But here at the end of three years, he learns he is not converted yet. The same thing is true in Matthew chapter 18. The disciples are gathered around having an argument about which of them is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Peter is no doubt part of this argument. In the midst of this argument, now more than two and a half years into his ministry, Jesus takes a child, stands the child in the midst of the disciples while they're bantering over who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven and says to them, unless you are converted and become like this child, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, we have disciples who thought they were converted are not converted yet, more than two and a half years after they decided to follow Jesus. You see the problem. The moment we make converted getting saved, it's like we lose the rest of our spiritual life after that. Two scenes. One is Peter in Luke chapter 5, and the other scene is at the end of his life. In Luke chapter 5, Peter's out in his boat. Jesus walks by the sea, sees Peter, and gets into Peter's boat. <laughs> he just helps himself. He tells Peter to push off from the shore so he can turn and speak to the people. 
Jesus turns, stands up in the boat, addresses the people on the shore, and then after he's through speaking, he turns and says to Peter, now push out, go out into the deep, and drop your nets and get you some fish. Peter is a fisherman. This is what he does. He says, Lord, we've been doing this all night, and we haven't caught anything. But you say so. So he pushes out into the deep. They drop the net, and no sooner do they drop the nets when they feel that familiar drag on the net. They start pulling the nets into the boat, and there are hundreds of fish such that the boat starts to sink. There's so many fish. Peter, now overcome by this moment, falls to his knees in the boat and says to Jesus, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. So here we have a man who is fairly self-absorbed, just in order to play along, patronize Jesus, we'll go put the nets down. But he's pretty much the same guy. The end of Peter's life is not in the Bible, but there are historical records that report what he reported. Peter has moved to Rome. Nero is the emperor. He has declared the death of all Christians. Peter hears this. He decides to leave Rome and spare his life. He gets on the Via Appia, or the Appian Way. The road is still there to this day. You can walk it. He starts walking outside of the city to run for his life. And he says he saw the risen Christ coming in the other direction. He says to him, Kovadi, Lord, where are you going and Jesus allegedly says, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. In that moment, Peter knows that that will be the end. Jesus is not speaking of himself. He is speaking of Peter. You remember at the end of John chapter 21, he said, the day is coming when someone will lead you by the hand to places you don't want to go. Peter knows that this is that moment. He turns around, he goes back into Rome, he is arrested, and he is uh, convicted. They're ready to kill him by crucifixion. He asks one last favor, that he be crucified upside down, because in his words, he is not worthy to die like his Lord. And so he is tied, not nailed, to a cross, the cross is inverted and put into its position. Peter dies upside down. Why do I tell this story? Because it's radically different than the guy in the boat 30 years ago. If we want to speak about conversion, we have to speak about the length of a person's life, the whole thing, not just a single incident where something is different. People move in and out of changes all the time. We have to compare their life over years, not moments. Now I am speaking of us. When you look back at the moment when you first decided to become a Christian, what in your life is substantially different today than was true when you first started? There should be some visible evidence that our lives are slowly changing. I think 
there isn't just one conversion. There's a series of conversions all along the way. And every one of these have the same characteristics. They're almost all unexpected. We start with a wrestle with God. Something inside of us changes and we begin to live differently. I don't think that happens once. I think it happens again and again and again. This is true of Peter. When Peter walks on water, he's not just defying gravity. Something inside of him is changing. When Peter stands in Caesarea Philippi and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God in Matthew chapter 16, he's not just making a declaration of faith. Something has happened to that guy. When Peter goes up the Mount of Transfiguration and he sees Jesus completely transfigured, the word literally means in the Greek, peeled back. He sees the humanity of Jesus peeled back back and he stares into his divinity. I think it rattled him and he's never the same again. He will never pray the same. He will never talk to Jesus the same after that day. I think that was a moment as radical as the first one. When Peter denies him for the third time, I swear to God, I don't know this guy which is not what he was saying. I think he was saying, I swear to God, that's not the guy I thought he was. Messiahs are not walked out with their hands tied behind their back. Messiahs don't get crucified. That's not the guy I was following. I think it's a pivotal moment. After the third denial, the rooster crows. He hears it. He turns, and it says Jesus stared at him. And he went out into the night and wept bitterly. I think that was a pivotal moment. Hours earlier, he had said, I'll die for you. Now he learns that he's not the man he thought he was. He's way overestimated his faith. And now it's clear to everybody, including him, that's a pivotal moment. Are you tracking? There's this, yes? There's a series of these moments that go through his life. And they're critical to me because these are the same kinds of moments that I think we need in ours. We need to shift our trust from self to God until we step out of the boat. We need to watch the stakes go up to see what messiahs really do and double down and say, I'm still in. We need to have our vision of Christ transfigured. We need a moment where we see ourselves as we truly are. These moments change us, everyone. There is none more foundational, I think, than the first one in Matthew 4. Peter's out in the boat, 100 yards off ashore. Jesus comes walking by the sea, sees Peter, sees his brother in the boat, and he shouts out to him, come and follow me, and I will turn you into fishermen who catch people. So the Bible says they drop everything instantly. They row to shore, they get out of the boat, and they start to follow him. So much of his future is wrapped up in those four verses in Matthew chapter 4. And, and as I look at it, so much seems different from what 
sounds like evangelism today. For starters, the word follow me means to come alongside. It doesn't mean to get behind him like he's a tour guide. It's a combination of two words in Greek. One means a road or a path, and the other means in union with. And so the statement, the call to follow me is a call to get in step with Jesus and start walking along the path. And as you walk along, we are talking not about his life. Jesus had his life, and his life on earth is now over. What remains is your life. And so the point in following him is never just to imitate Jesus, but to interpret what Jesus would do in your job and your situation, because that is what disciples are always talking about. How would Jesus do my job if he had it? Peter is not asking for the forgiveness of sins. He's not asking to go to heaven. He's not trying to be a Christian. We can't load onto this moment stuff that isn't there. He is simply curious about who this is guy is. And it turns out the first conversion is a change in curiosity. It's a change of interest. In the stuff you think about, and you care about, you can't figure out. I wonder if we need to restore a sense of curiosity about Jesus, especially among Christians. Are you there? Because we have him figured out. Jesus is both more liberal than you and more conservative than you. In matters of finance, he's more liberal. He gives it all away. In matters of sexuality, he's more conservative. He says, if you even lust, in matters of enemies, he calls for us not only to forgive, but to bless and to pray for, not because he wants us to be nice people. That's your mother. It's because he knows something about your enemies that you don't know. And if you knew what he knew about money, you'd handle it differently. If you knew what he knew about enemies, you would treat them differently. If you knew what he knew about humanity, you would be more hospitable. If you knew what he knew about marriage, you would be more sanctified in your vows. I think there's room among religious people to ask a lot of questions about who this character is. Because he says some truly outrageous things. Which if you haven't been numbed to them, having heard them so much, oh, I know that. Oh, 
I know that, which means I've heard that. <laughs> They're shocking. So I suggest, um, I suggest maybe we get into small circles with other Christians. Start there. And maybe we start asking questions like, what, what did Jesus say that irritates you, annoys you, because it sounds ludicrous? And it would be far better to just say it, bull-faced, than to pretend that nothing shocks us anymore. It would be good to gather around the question, what does Jesus do effortlessly and routinely? And why is that so easy for him? And it's not for me. To gather around the question, not what would Jesus do? We know that. Why would he do it? Why does anybody think the way he thinks? Where did he learn this? Far better for us to wrestle than simply comply. Sunday school taught me how to obey, but at the same time, it stifled my curiosity. This is a call for the curious to come alive in you again. When Peter follows Jesus, it is out of curiosity. There is nothing in that call that I can tell he is following for his own sake. It is more that he is taken up with Jesus than he is taken up with himself and trying to bring Jesus into his life. It's not what he's doing. He's simply leaving his life in order to follow Jesus. And that, I think, is a different direction. And that call is always outward. Well, I don't suggest that you and I ever lose our curiosity. I suggest what happens is other things come up alongside uh, that curiosity. Good things, noble things, jobs, families, projects, degrees, they are all good things, but they grow up alongside this curiosity for Jesus. And you can't. In my yard, uh, every now and then, Um, well, first, I hate gardening. It's a, it's a pain. It's, and I'm not, but I've noticed a tendency, you guys, among the weeds that are in our yard. Some of them, they all have a different way to survive. Some are just prickly and basically says, you touch me, I'll hurt you. But there's others, the way that they survive is they grow up alongside the thing it wants to overtake, and they send off a flower that looks exactly like the flower. Are you tracking? And the longer this goes, the two start to intertwine until you truly cannot tell what is weed and what is flower. This is what I think happens to our interest in our curiosity for Jesus Christ. I don't think we ever surrender it. I just think other things come along. Noble things, good things that grow up right next to it until we can no longer distinguish the pursuit of Jesus from every other pursuit. They look exactly the same until we think when we are doing those other things, we are pursuing Jesus. They are that similar. I don't think they're always the same. 
think we can go years without being curious again. So my challenge for you this morning is that you examine after we leave the things that have grown up around and then after into your pursuit of Jesus that is slowly siphoning the energy off. This is the first step, not the last. John Wesley has written a prayer that helps us put language to this. It's a prayer that helps us say we will serve God, follow God, pursue God, no matter what happens to us. We've got the words to that prayer, and I just think the most appropriate way for us to be sent this morning is not with anything that I say, but something we say together. Would you join me by standing, looking to the screen, and church with sincerity and humility, self-examination, let this be our prayer. Here we go. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee, brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely, heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I've made on earth, let this be ratified in heaven. Amen. Let us go from this place with God's Holy Spirit to seek with curiosity Jesus Christ this week. You are dismissed.